no mai hari mai ki nga tangata o uh, Pukihino uh, ki te kaupapa i tēnei rā. Welcome to this webinar for Pukihino Lampton Ward uh, on the annual plan and also the parking policy. My name is Esther Buchold of Soulstone and I'll be your host and um, MC for this evening. As is the custom with Wellington City Council meetings, we will begin with a karakia. Whakataka te hau, uh, which is a, um, uh, a karakia which evokes the um, natural um, environment uh, for, the, for the meeting that we have here now. So please join me. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mākina ki uta, ki a mātara tara ki tai, e hi aki ana te atakura, he chio, he huka, he hauhu, ti hei, mauri ora. And welcome. In recent weeks, uh, life has changed in ways that none of us could have imagined, and we have all had to adapt to new ways of living, working, and playing. And these sessions are designed as an alternative to the usual face to face consultations that Wellington City Council provides. In this session, you'll have the opportunity to hear from Andy Foster, our Mayor, and uh, local councillors. But first, a bit of housekeeping. For those of you who are new to webinars, you'll see a dialogue box there on your right hand side uh, and you can have a, have a play uh, with the um, controls uh, to change the um, screen and particularly the settings on how you see us as speakers. There's also a uh, handout drop down box and we've supplied you with four handouts, uh, one on the parking policy, uh, one on the annual plan, uh, the PowerPoint uh, of this session and also an accessible uh, PowerPoint. Uh, these, these webinars are being recorded so you can see them afterwards and by next Wednesday they'll also be closed captioned and up online on Let's Talk. Uh, you as the attendees are on mute, but you can log your questions with us live uh, in the questions drop down um, slide. Uh, and please, uh, you can start doing that now and throughout the sessions. We'll pick up as many of those as we can. Thank you, Olivia. So our agenda for tonight is uh, first this introduction by myself, uh, and then Andy uh, will be giving uh, an overview of the annual plan, answering some questions, some of those that you've put in earlier and some that you can send in live. And then Jenny Condy will be talking on the parking policy and fielding some of your questions. This will be followed by a panel of your local councillors uh, and the mayor, uh, both the questions that you have put to us beforehand and at the time. So that's, that's our run plan for the day. So these are the councillors who will be with you. So if you would like to uh, come in and join us now and introduce yourselves. Cameras on, microphones on. Thank you. And if you just like to take the slide off, Olivia. And uh, Andy. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, Andy Foss. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, Andy Foster. I've got the privilege of being your Mayor. Um, I live up in Karori and uh, I think we've be, just been reflecting a little bit on uh, what lockdown, uh, the lockdown period has been uh, like for all of us. Uh, and you know, it's been fascinating being able to work from home, uh, do a lot of the work that we do do, but also having two teenage uh, children who have been doing their studies um, from home as well. So a, a very interesting period. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Condi. <clears throat> Kia ora mai tato. Uh, I'm Jenny Condi. I'm a councillor for the Northern Ward. I'm here tonight to present to you on the parking policy as it's part, part of my portfolio area. Um, hopefully I don't have any exciting BBC dad style moments tonight because in the previous webinar I had my four year old crash in during bedtime and during the council meeting today I had my dog crash in and sit on my lap for some of the meetings so it's always a good time at this house. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, and councillor Pennett. Well, kia ora koutou. Um, I own a panel, one of the Pukehina uh, Lampton Ward councillors, um, and really happy to be here and looking forward to hearing your questions. Lovely. And welcome, Councillor Young. You're on mute. Um, 
Hi, I'm Nicola Young. I'm also a Lambton Ward councillor. I live on Mount Victoria and I'm looking forward to tonight's session. So um, let's hope it goes really well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And welcome, Councillor Paul. Uh, kia ora tato, um, hui mai nei i tō tato nei hui uh, i te pō, uh, ko Tamitha Pō tōku ingoa, hui uri tēnei nō Ngāti Awa me waikato tainui hoki. Uh, kia ora Pukihino, my name is Tamitha Paul, I am the third uh, Pukihino Lambton Ward councillor here to talk to you all, have recorded all with you all tonight about the annual plan, really looking forward to it. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, hai kia ora. mai. Uh, thank you. So um, I'd like, uh, Olivia, if you could bring up the... Um, PowerPoint for us again and we'll see the rest of you except Andy shortly. So that's a little bit about us uh, but now a little bit about you. Um, so of those of you who have registered today, um, there were nearly 60 of you, um, nearly 70 of you live in this ward, uh, quite a lot of you from wider Wellington City Council and also welcome, special welcome to 5% of you who are from outside Wellington City. Uh, and as well as those of you who are listening now, this, this webinar will be posted online uh, and that's often very popular, so welcome to you if that's you too. You also answered, asked us some questions. Uh, you had a range of questions uh, about the annual plan. Here's a few of them that we'll be looking at and answering tonight. You also asked questions about the parking policy, particularly interested in parking in the central city and that balance between car parking and active modes of transport. Uh, and you also asked some questions, here's a summary of a few of them, uh, about things happening in your community, uh, which we will be posing to the panel in the second half of this session. Uh, so just before we start with uh, Andy's presentation, uh, we'd like to run a short poll uh, so that Andy has a picture of um, how familiar you are with the annual plan. So if you'd like to launch that, Olivia. We'd like to know whether prior to this webinar, you got a chance to look at the Wellington City Council annual plan uh, online. So just uh, tick the box that makes most sense to you. Have we got those coming in, Olivia? Yep, we've got about half of our participants today responding, a few more coming in now. But I'm just gonna right. close that poll and share those results with you. Fantastic. So, um, oh, awesome. So um, 70 or 80% of you uh, have at least had a bit of a look. So um, Andy, uh, on that note, I'm gonna pass over to you. Uh, to give people a more in-depth insight into the annual plan and the decisions that you're offering there. Thank you. Okay, I think we go, we go straight to the, the next slide, I think, don't we? Yes. Right. Okay, but welcome again, everybody. Um, great to have you along uh, here with us, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to walk you through what's in the annual plan, although clearly uh, most of you have already read it, at least in part, um, and then to go through the parking policy and then to try and um, answer some questions both on the annual plan, the parking policy, and, and there's a, a number of local ward uh, issues that people wanted to raise as well with us. So looking forward to that. So first of all, we're going to start off with um, COVID's impact on, um, on Wellington City. And for some of us, it's, you know, we've been able to work from home. Um, uh, you know, we're still employed uh, and, you know, it's been a different time, a very different time, but um, it hasn't had necessarily a huge economic impact on us. But for other people where they are in businesses which have been not able to operate at all, uh, they're employed, they run the business, uh, it's had a dramatic effect and will probably continue to have a dramatic effect. We don't know how, how big, uh, how significant that effect is going to be. Uh, we've seen the economic projections that suggest to us that uh, there's going to be significant unemployment as a result of the, the COVID, uh, slowed, uh, the COVID slowdown and, and, and the lockdown process. Um, but we don't know how big that's going to be. But what we do know is that it's going to have a significant effect right across the country, right across the world, uh, and we're not going to be immune from that. Uh, so we'll go on to the next, the next slide. COVID's also had a significant impact on the council. So not only is it Im impacting businesses, and uh, you know, particularly in the areas like accommodation, retail, uh, the events and arts, uh, but it's also had a significant effect on council. And so we are projecting that council will lose almost $70 million in revenue and in dividends. So that's, that's our user charges, that's the dividend from the airport. Some of that's in the year we're already in, that's the 2019-20 year. And some of that is in the, the year that we're talking about now, which is the 2020-2021 year. 
uh, we've also um, we started this process. Um, this is the third year of our 2018 2028 long term plan, and that set out the, the, the what our rates expectations were right the way through to 2028. But this year, that's the 2020 2021 year I'm, I'm referring to there, we were expecting a 7.1% rates increase. The following year, 6.8, the year after that, 6.2, and then 7.0%. So those four years effectively close to 28%. And that excluded provision for Let's Get Wellington moving, Civic Square in the library. It excluded any extra investment in water. It excluded any investment in the three temporary libraries in the central city. And it certainly didn't include the $70 million, which we're going to lose as a result of uh, the COVID impact. So you can see we had a really significant pressures on council, on council costs, and therefore on rates. Next slide, please, Olivia. So when we went into the uh, the pandemic situation and, and the lockdown, the, the first thing we needed to do is to try and soften the impact because we knew that a lot of businesses were simply not going to be in a position to be able to afford uh, the rates that we would impose upon them, uh, the, the various um, rentals, where we're the landlord, fees, charges, et cetera. So the first, what we did pretty early on was to put in place a pandemic response and recovery plan. So the, the first bit was to try and soften the impact of what we did. So that what we did immediately was to say, we are going to provide for those people who needed it. And there are a set of criteria. You'd have seen those in your rates bill if you're a, a rate payer uh, that have come through the mail in the last few days. Uh, and that was to allow businesses and residents who can show a, a significant impact from the COVID-19 lockdown to be able to defer their rates without the usual uh, rates penalty. So you, that allowed you to put those rates off until December. We also, when we were the landlord, it said, look, we're not going to be uh, collecting uh, those rentals at this stage. And also where you paid fees and charges, whether it's in uh, you know, the hospitality industry and you might have had a, a liquor license or you might have had a, um, a pavement rental, those sort of things. We also said, look, we're not going to charge you for those kind of things during the lockdown period because we know that you can't earn any money and therefore you can't afford to pay it. So that was our first uh, our first response. The other part was that we obviously also put a lot of um, emphasis on welfare, uh, and particularly for those of our community who are uh, the least able, um, who are the most vulnerable, the homeless community in particular. Uh, and so, so we spent a lot of time and energy in supporting uh, organisations like City Mission, DCM, etc., to who, who did a fantastic job working with those most vulnerable people. And we, we had a lot more people who actually needed their services as well. Uh, and then we've also been doing a lot of work to plan recovery. And that's particularly about trying to draw more people back into the central city. The central city is a jewel, not just for Wellington City, but also for the rest of the region. And, and we believe it's the best central city in the country. We need to put that central city back together again, essentially to repair it and to bring people back. So we have a, that fantastic vibrancy and, and the, the, the life that we all love uh, our central city having. Let's move on to the next, next slide, please, Olivia. The second part, so that's the pandemic response and recovery plan. The second part is the draft annual plan. And what we've done here, um, obviously, this is what we're consulting on at the moment. And it had to be a plan that balanced the rates impact with the need to continue to invest in existing services and invest in the city itself. So we don't want the city just to stand still. We don't want to do nothing. Uh, but we also can't just stop all the services and, uh, and just some people wanted us to go to a, a zero rates situation. We could have achieved that, but the only way we could achieve that is to, to cut quite a, a number of services to do that. Uh, and so we, we'd, we'd appreciate people's feedback on those sort of things. We think we've got the balance about right. We started off with a 9.2% rates increase, which we were about to go out with. Um, and then we've drawn that back to 5.1%. Let's go to the next slide, please, Olivia. Now, as I said, um, we are borrowing. It's one of the ways we're softening the impact is to borrow to offset lost revenue. So as I said, $20 million, roughly speaking, we're losing in the current 2019-20 year. And then we estimate we'll lose about another $38 million in revenue 2020-2021. And we were already projecting to uh, or intending to go out with a number of uh, user charge increases. We've pulled back on nearly all of those. And that equates to another $11 million. So 38 plus 11 plus 20, you're, you're roughly at the $70 million I mentioned earlier. If we were to charge for that now, uh, it would add about 12% to the rates. Now that is never going to be a comfortable proposition and least of all now. This is the rainy day. And so what we, and I know that uh, quite a number of other councils are doing across the country is to borrow to cover the lost revenue. We think we can do that because we're expecting that revenue to recover over a period of time, over the next two or three years, and therefore 
uh, we'll be back to a, a sort of balanced budget situation. What we can't do is borrow to fund today's groceries. That wouldn't be a reasonable proposition. So we'll move on to the next one. Thanks, Olivia. As I mentioned earlier that we also need to continue to invest in the future, so we can't just have our city standing still. If we're going to be a confident, proud capital city, we need to keep on investing. What are the kind of things that people are telling us they want us to invest in? Well, we want to become a more sustainable city. We obviously need to keep on investing in resilience. Um, we could. One of the propositions we had really early on in the lockdown period was what would happen if we had an earthquake at the same time? That really didn't bear thinking about what well, we had, did have to prepare for that. And we, as a city, we're going to have to keep on making sure we become a more resilient city. And we also want to keep on investing in the overall livability of the city. If uh, you know, we want people to, to love living here, uh, we've got to keep on investing in the things that people love. So what are those kind of things? Well, I've mentioned some of them already. Let's get Wellington moving. We're actually trying to accelerate that. It's the things that transform our city to try and make our, our transport system more sustainable. So we're trying to accelerate investment in walking, cycling and public transport. Tanaka Civic Square. You can't really expect to draw people back into the city and to make the central city a vibrant place if you have the heart of the city uh, not functional. So we need to invest in that. And I know there's a question on, on the Central Library, so I'll answer that later on. We've also got uh, two of the temporary Central City Libraries already uh, operational and another one to come, Te Awe, which will be opened uh, in July. And then we're also investing more in the Three Waters Network. In the last uh, few months, we've seen some uh, very high profile breakages in our water system and our, and our sewage system. Uh, and we're obviously working very hard to get those fixed. And we know that we need to invest more in those. Uh, and that's what we're doing in this budget. And we're also doing uh, through the mayoral task force, we're looking at how much we need to invest going forward uh, in our water and our sewage networks. Next one, please, Olivia. So key, key projects for 2021. So these are included in the existing long-term plan. That's the 2018 to 2028 long-term plan and in this budget. So three waters, we've added another $2.9 million into the budget. And that's basically for doing condition assessment. So we actually know what the, the state of our waters network is and also in what we're calling roving crews. So uh, another team to be able to go out and look for uh, leaks, look for places where uh, the network's not performing as we want it to. And that's both the public and the private network. So uh, private individuals network as well. The convention and exhibition center, we get lots of questions about that. Well, the, the work is underway. It started in September uh, of last year. Uh, and we've already invested heavily in that. It's, it's about 800 jobs involved in the construction process and the supply chains to support that construction process. That's expected to open in 2023. The St. James Theatre is undergoing a significant strengthening uh, uh, work and also some of the services refurbishment, and that's expected to open at the end of 2021. Needs to open then because we need to have it ready for the 2022 uh, Festival of the Arts. Tanaka Civic Precinct, including Central Library, and I'll, I'll get one in early here. The paper on the Central Library will be in the public arena tomorrow. So we've been waiting for that for a long time, been pushing for it for a long time, and now that will be with us so you can all look at that and, uh, and have a good think about that. Town Hall, um, the work on that has been underway for a few months now, um, and that work is continuing. Again, that's expected to reopen in 2023. And let's get Wellington moving, I've already um, mentioned, but we will have a lot of decisions on let's get Wellington moving, a lot of public consultation on let's get Wellington moving, uh, parts of that over the next uh, few few weeks and months. And we're already, we're about to make decisions on the safer speed limits for the, for the central city as well very shortly. Next one, please, Olivia. There are also quite a lot of projects in the, uh, in the community. Uh, the first two there are resilience projects, the Nio Gorge Slip Repair and Stabilisation. If you've been up Nio Gorge, you'll see there's a, a whack and great slip there. Um, the Wadestown uh, Retaining Wall Resilience Upgrade. And then we've made, we are proposing in this budget to invest more in home energy audits. And that's about our uh, response to climate change. That's another, another piece of that response. And also in weed and pest control, uh, because we, we've been on an incredible environmental restoration journey. And this is about accelerating that journey. And then there's a number of community centres to be upgraded, including Aro Valley in the Lambton Ward, uh, and then some uh, investments in the northern suburbs, Newlands Park Redevelopment and Alex Moore Park Hub. I'm just going to finish off with the last bit here, which is to explain. Next slide, please, Olivia. The last bit here, two rates options, 5.1% uh, and 2.3%. Uh, we'll go straight to the next slide. Olivia, please. 
So I'm just going to talk to both these slides. So there's a 5.1 slide and a 2.3 slide in one go. Uh, what's the difference between, between the two of them? Essentially, what we do is that every three years we revalue our um, our assets. We've just done the revaluation of our three waters assets, and what happens is that reflects. We do that to reflect the increasing cost of replacing those assets as they get to the end of their life. We need to replace them, and obviously, it costs more to do that now than it did maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago. That's why we revalue re them, and that revaluation then flows through into um, what we do is we then depreciate those assets to to um, to reflect their their gradual aging. And we use that depreciation to invest in renewal, in other, in other words, new reservoirs, new pipes. If we fund it less, we have less money to do that work. Uh, and also we're effectively with borrowing to do that. So the 5.1% rates increase, which is our preferred option, essentially is saying we are going to collect the money we need to invest in the renewal of that key infrastructure. But we'll go to the last slide there. If we were to go for the 2.3%, what that means is we're effectively not collecting enough money to fund that renewal work. And that means we'd either be borrowing it or we'd be doing less of it. Okay, we'll go to the, the last slide. I think it takes us to the end. Cool. Right. So look, thank you very much for your patience in listening to that. And um, we've got a quick poll there, which uh, Esther is going to walk you through. Olivia, You're on mute, Esther. <laughs> Could you launch that poll for us? So we're just, uh, in terms of Andy's presentation, we're just interested in whether you understood the trade-offs between the two rates options uh, that he uh, laid out for us. So just to choose the answer that makes most sense to you. Sure do, the trade-offs make sense. I don't understand them at all and I need more time to have an opinion on that. So Olivia, have we um, had some results? Yes, those results are flooding in, and so I'm just going to close this poll now and share those with you. Very good. So, um, made quite a lot of sense to most. Only a few people haven't understood them, and about a third of you need more time to have an opinion on that. Fair enough. It's a it's a lot to digest uh, quickly. Thank you for that. So uh, we asked you that poll to help us decide on the questions uh, that we're going to pitch to uh, Andy Foster now. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Diane, who has been fielding your questions uh, and organising your pre-registration questions. What's your first question? What's one of the big themes that's coming up here uh, from our audience tonight? Okay, uh, thanks. Hi Esther, can you hear me okay? Yes. Terrific. Yep. Okay. We've had lots of questions about the library and library services. Mm. Um, so this is a mix of a uh, registration question from Gwyneth and then we've had a live question just come in uh, from Matthew. And the question is, what's likely to happen to the Central Library? And then Matthew has asked um, about the high footfall um, and use of the smaller localised libraries that have been introduced and how that might influence services. Cool. Oh, so good questions. So, as I said uh, during the um, earlier presentation, well, we know people have been hanging out for the um, the paper on the libraries. We, that people want to have a look at that. Um, what, so, what we've done is that uh, we've got a whole lot of engineers together uh, to do some some work on the the engineering structure for the the library, uh, and then that's all been um, QS. So, the, the quantity surveyors have given us some um, some dollar numbers as to uh, to what they think it will cost to strengthen the library to various different levels, and you'll see those uh, numbers tomorrow. They've also given us some numbers on what a new library will cost to build if we were to take that option. And we're going to put all these, all this information out in front of you. Uh, the intention is to have a significant consultation about that. And it's really an opportunity for, for everyone to look at that information. I'm, I'm particularly interested if uh, people can look at the engineering information and say, hey, we could do that for a, we could do that a different way and we could do it you know, a different price. That would be particularly interesting. Um, and the other part we're obviously going to be starting to think about is what's the relationship between the library and Civic Square and how can we improve that? So that there'll be a lot to think about um, in that in that uh, paper and a lot to think about as we go through that consultation process. But we finally got there. I mean, we were about to do that just before COVID um, arrived. The, the aim was to hit the, the end of March uh, or the first week of April. And then of course COVID arrived and that just put the whole thing back because key staff just weren't available to, to finish the papers off. You were muted. 
Uh oh, I'll go to another question, <laughs> shall I? Okay. Um, so uh, this is a question from Harrison, and Harrison's question is: How will the plan address the lack of affordable housing and unaffordable rent in Wellington? So there's nothing specifically in the annual plan that we're doing that's different in that space, but there are already a whole lot of things that we were already doing as a, as a result of um, both the, the long-term plan that was signed off in 2018 and initiatives since then, and also initiatives to come. So the, the three things I'd highlight, one is we're continuing to invest in our, um, our social housing portfolio. Uh, that's an ongoing issue. We're also talking to the government about that as a, a shovel-ready opportunity. We're saying that you know, some help would be very, very useful. Um, we're uh, also we are continuing work. We've got um, partnerships with some private sector providers where we essentially take the head lease uh, and we take that for 15 years, and then we are able to um, to lease that space out to particularly to key workers. We're looking at, at, at people in the you know emergency services, teaching those sort of professions uh, who may not be able always to afford the rentals which are um, which are in place at the moment. And that we're expecting the first one of those to come on stream in July. Uh, and the third part is that we were about to go out uh, pre-COVID with our next um, uh, part of consultation on our spatial plan, planning for growth. And we've had to haul that back a little bit because that, that required a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, engagement. And we clearly obviously couldn't do that during the COVID uh, time. And that's about changing our planning rules uh, to allow for greater housing uh, uh, development across various parts of the city. So the, that will be a huge exercise because it then flows through to our district plan. Okay, nice one. Thanks, Andy. Um, so I'm going, this is a, a bit related, this question from Nigel. Uh, given COVID-19 has caused social inequ inequality, sorry, how can we help fellow citizens who can't pay their rates? And he says specifically, is there a fund or a charity or something that people can do? Well, look, there's, there's any number of funds and charities which can help people who are struggling. Um, as to whether that's about paying rates or not, I'm not sure. Um, but the two things that we can do in terms of, the, of rates, one is this, <coughs> excuse me, one of them is a long-term rates remission um, policy, which is available for certain, uh, certain rate payers. Uh, and that's usually related to income and ability to afford rates. The other one is, the, as I said, what we've done for the 2019-20 rates, so that's the rates bill that you've probably got in the mail, mail in the last few days, we're allowing that to be um, deferred. Normally there'd be a 10% penalty on deferral, but we're, we're scratching that 10% penalty and the only penalty will be essentially council's cost of borrowing, which is about it's less than 2%. Um, and we're allowing that rates bill to be deferred till December. And what we've also allowed for in this uh, annual plan, this draft annual plan, and we'd like your feedback on that, is potentially to allow the next two rates um, rates bills to also be deferred. Now you have to show that you've actually been impacted by COVID, but if you can show that, then it allows for those rates bills to be deferred as well and maybe spread across the next two, five, ten years. And so again, we'd like your feedback on, you know, how long you think that should be spread over and whether you, whether you, think, you think it's a good idea as well. Uh, sorry about that uh, break in transmission. Thank you very much. So a change of uh, option. You're clearly thinking about this as well as a council. Yep. Let's um, take another, shall we take another question or two? No, Yep. take one more. Oh, oh, sorry, yes, I, I do, I've got another one here. Um, Tim, I'm, I see you've got a great question here about Build Back Better, and it's such a good one that I want to suggest that we use it at the end of the session as a bit of a wrap up. So just to know that I've got that and we're going to park it for now. And so Andy, your next question is about, it's from Alan, and it is about, um, we were going to have a rates rise that was high and she's got 9.1% here and it's now 5.1. So what's been removed? How did that happen? There's a degree to which what we've done is we've essentially capitalised some things which we could have put on the rates at the moment. So that they're really around some of the planning for Let's Get Wellington moving uh, and uh, also things like the, the planning for Civic Square. So, I mean, I probably argue that we could capitalise those anyway uh, because let's get Wellington moving. We do the planning, which is the bit which you would say is an operating expense, but we do that planning because we intend to then do a capital project. You know, we intend to do a bus priority lane, we intend to do a cycle lane. Um, and likewise with Civic Square, we're doing the planning because we're intending to do some physical work as a result of that planning. Uh, and so to me, that uh, it seems logical that we capitalise those. So that, that effectively is what we've done. And that, that's the largest part of the difference between uh, the, the 9.2 and the 5.1. 
So there are more questions that have come in. We don't have time to answer all of them now, but the, um, the officers will be looking at all of your questions uh, and following them up uh, and posting them and frequently asked questions on the Let's Talk page. So I'm going to wrap there now. Thank you very much, Andy. And I'm so I'll going drop to off now. Okay. You can and um, invite. invite Jenny Connie in oh, to talk about the um, parking policy. So welcome Jenny and Olivia if you would like to bring that PowerPoint up. Thanks very much. Um, we'll go straight to the next slide. I'm here to talk about the parking policy today. So the pur purpose of the parking policy is really to create a framework. What's in the policy is not going to create any changes on your streets immediately. It's about creating a framework that's going to guide our decision making about parking for the next 10 years. So we're looking at how we're going to prioritise parking in different parts of the city. And the big issue here is that as we go forward, we know that we're not going to have more on street parking than we have at the moment. I can't magically widen the roads for us, particularly with Wellington's geography. Um, so and we are going to start to have fewer cut on street car parks as we roll out things like Let's Get Wellington moving and we have to make space on our streets for other kinds of transport modes. So we know we're going to be having fewer on street parks and we need to think really carefully about how we're going to prioritise the use of those parks and how we prioritise the use of our street space in general. So we really, this is about what our values and priorities are, which is why it's really, really important that we hear from you and have discussions with you about the future of our parking. The framework will provide great transparency so that as we make decisions going forward, if we come to your street and we say, okay, we've got a parking problem here and we want to, to make some decisions about how we solve it, the policy will provide really clear guidelines about what the principles are that we should be following. And as I said, this is really about how do we um, grow our city, how do we support uh, mode shift into other kinds of active modes as we're trying to get to Ta'atakura and tackle climate change. And, and those things are gonna have really significant impacts on our streets. The review specifically looks at council parking. We don't look at private parking. So a lot of the parking in our city is, is Wilson style private parking. And most of council's parking is on street. We have a very small amount of off street parking, but mostly in the parking policy review, what we're focused on is that on street parking and how we're gonna use it for our city in the future. Next slide, please. So the policy overview, as I said, it, it's got a framework, so it sets out our objectives about what it is we're trying to achieve and our principles about how we're going to apply the policy when we get to your street or a part of your area. We also set out uh, in the policy a parking space hierarchy, which looks at what type of parking and other uses of the space we're going to prioritise. So that on street space might be prioritised in some places for bus lanes or bike lanes, or it might be prioritised for residence parking or loading zones, different kinds of parking and different uses in different parts of the city. So the parking space hierarchy says in this part of the city, what is going to be the priority on the space for our space on these streets? And then we also cover three other areas, which is area based planning. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about pricing and as well about parking management and how we tackle problems when they come up. So I'm going to go on to the next slide and we've got a slide on each of those. Thank you. So one of the great things about this policy is we're looking at a new area based approach. In the past, we've often looked at parking as there's a specific problem we hear from somebody about there's a problem on my street. And so our officers go in and say, OK, we're going to fix that by changing this and moving that over there. And we make changes on the street. And then what happens is actually the problem just flows over into nearby streets and creates new problems in, in, in the spillover areas. So by taking an area based approach, we want to look at the whole space, not just the one street that's having a problem and work out a plan for that whole area so we don't keep chasing our tail. And it's really great being able to take an area based approach because it means we can also be quite a lot more holistic about how we approach parking. So we don't just look at it from a transport point of view. We can also say, well, if it's Newtown, we can get the DHB involved and talk about how they what their needs are for parking as a large employer. We can talk to community groups or look at the other facilities that are in the area and really bring in a whole bunch of people into the conversation who aren't transport engineers, but are just part of their community talking about how we're going to use this space the best for our community. So those are ways that, that we can actually, um, as I say, kind of go through our city part by part and um, make some of these changes in our streets as we go. Next slide, please. So pricing, again, there's nothing in this policy that will change the price on the street tomorrow. 
Um, what we're looking at is a framework for how we think about pricing of parking going into the future. And what we're proposing here is called demand-based pricing. And it means that where the parking is in highest demand, which means it's hardest to find a park, then that's where the price should be high. And where there's not a lot of demand for parking and there's lots of empty spaces, then the price should be lower. And so this would be a fundamental shift in the way that we charge for parking. In the past, we've pretty much, um, we set a parking rate right across most of the city and it stays the same for a really long time, sometimes years before we change it again. Whereas demand-based pricing is much more responsive. We would look at, for example, um, in Courtney Place, we know that Courtney Place parking is really busy in the evenings, but not so much during the day. And parking in Lampton Quay in that part of the city is really busy during the day and not so much at night. So demand-based pricing means we could actually have different prices for different areas, at different times of the day um, that would reflect the, the demand and the, that is for, the, for those parks. And this is a system that's been operating in many cities around the world really effectively and Auckland have been using it for the last few years. So our proposal is, is in this policy, we wanna hear from you about whether you think this is a good idea. Um, and if you do like it, then it's something that we can roll out on our streets in the future, but it won't be an immediate change. Next slide, please. And this is our management hierarchy approach. So if, so, if a, a street or someone comes to us and says, hey, we've got a problem with the parking here, I can never get a park, it's, it's such a hassle, then what do our staff do about that? What, have, what are our tools in our toolkit? And this sort of sets out which tools we would use and in what order. So uh, the first thing we would do is look at, at monitoring and enforcement. So are the rules that are in place already, are they being enforced? Do we need to get parking wardens out there a bit more just to make sure that people are respecting the rules? If we do that and we still don't have a solution to the problem, then we could look at bringing in other kinds of restrictions. We might look at time restrictions if there's no restrictions there at the moment. So we might say, okay, actually these parks are being used um, a lot for kind of park and ride and people are parking them all day. Maybe we should make them P120 so that they'll turn over more often so that um, retailers can have customers coming in. Um, if that's not enough to solve the problem, we can look at parking designations. And that means things like saying, oh, maybe this should be a loading zone if there's a particular kind of parking that we need here. Or a big issue in your ward would be uh, looking at residence parking zones and saying that these need to be set aside for particular people in a particular use. After that, we can look at parking charges. And as I've said around demand-based pricing, we might look at, at demand-based pricing as a way to deal with that. But um, if there's an area that doesn't have charging yet, we might need to bring charging in to help manage that problem. And if there is charging already there, then we could look at increasing the charges to help manage that demand. Finally, if none of those tools in our toolkit are enough to solve the problem, then we can look about uh, coming back to this area-based approach about looking at alternatives um, and, as, and looking at if, if we need to increase supply of off-street parking in the area and perhaps working with companies or um, and looking at how we might provide parking if there's, an, if there's a need for that. But we want to go through all of our other options first before we come to that, because there are a lot of other tools in our toolkit that we could use. Um, next slide, please. That's us. So that's um, time for questions, which I'm sure there will be many, because it's a really interesting area and people always have opinions about parking. They do, they do. We're just going to take a couple now, uh, and a stream of them have come in. I can um, see on my screen up here, uh, but they will be answered uh, and frequently asked questions and posted for you. So have you got just a couple for us, Diane? I do. Um, okay, so uh, this one's from Alan, uh, and it's just come in. Um, Jenny, can you please explain why the parking policy only covers Wellington City Council parking and not all parking? So thinking about some of those private car parking places as well. Sure. So it's a Wellington City Council policy, so we can really only control um, and affect those parking spaces that, that are under our control. Um, we A lot of the private parking, as I say, is owned by private companies, and so they make their own decisions about where they want parking to, to be and how much they're going to charge for it. As a council, we can work with them and, and we do work with them about what their prices are to try and um, influence that. But at the end of the day, they are private companies that are in business to make their own decisions. So we don't have any influence over what they decide to do. And let's just take one more question, Diane, before we bring the rest of the panel in. Right, you are. Um, this one's from Scott when he registered. Um, Parking policy, is it the tail wagging the dog? And the question is what's being done to reduce traffic in the city? 
Great question. And I think it's it's not the tail wagging the dog because it, it's one of these things we're trying to, to tackle uh, traffic and congestion in the city by giving people alternative ways of getting around. So getting people out of their cars, giving them options to walk or cycle, scooter or take public transport so that we can reduce traffic and reduce congestion. But in order to provide people with those choices and those options, they need the space to do that. And we have to find the space somewhere on our streets. And when we look at our streets and think, well, what are, where can we find any space? Especially in Wellington, our streets are very narrow. We don't have a lot of space to play with. And usually the only place we can find space in our streets is where the parking is at the moment. So that's really the big thing here is when it comes to the parking policy, what do you want to use that really valuable public space for? Do you want it to be used for parking, um, to support retailers and allow people to come into the city um, to make sure that people can, can access those services? Or do you want to be able to use it to support bike lanes and bus lanes and other ways that will allow people to get around it without their car? So it's a, it's a difficult decision and we really wanna hear about what you prioritize because that's what we're trying to, to get to the heart of here. And we'll talk to you shortly about the ways in which you can make submissions on these ideas. Thank you very much, Jenny, much appreciated. You, and now I'm going to invite uh, the rest of the panel in uh, because you had a whole host of questions uh, about your local community and uh, uh, your mayor and your councillors are uh, coming in now to um, answer those. Welcome back, thank you. Uh, Diane, where should we start and who with? Okay, so okay. I'm going to start, we've got a question here from uh, Marco and I think I'm going to send it to Tamitha. And the question is, how does this set Wellington up to address creating a livable city and other public, and the other public health crisis, which is climate change? Kia ora koutou. can you hear me all good? Right. Awesome, um, apologies if you can hear my dog snoring in the background, he's a very loud snorer. Um, yeah, um, thank you, Marco, for, for your question and for your presentation at uh, SPC this morning. Um, and a big uh, shout out to my colleague, Councillor Panett, who was um, instrumental in getting us to declare a climate emergency last year and, and Te Atakura, which is our first to zero plan. Um, so I think the, the main things within the annual plan that address climate change, um, uh, well, there, there, are, there are quite a few, and I think you could argue that a lot of the initiatives um, either directly or indirectly affect our emissions. Uh, the ones that stand out to me are our um, money that we'd like to set aside for home energy audits. Uh, we know that there's a large portion of our um, emissions come from stationary energy and if we can make sure that homes are warm, safe and dry and that they're preserving energy and conserving that, we know that that will be that, that will go a long way, but also it um, covers principles of a just transition. So that's making sure that um, people who are least um, responsible for our emissions are not uh, disproportionately affected by those. So uh, there's that. There's uh, Andy talked about the, uh, sorry, Mayor Foster talked about the money that um, could be put aside for pest control. And I think um, if we can control our pests and have greater biodiversity. I think that also has uh, flow on effects for our emissions, particularly if we can get more native species and other exotic species around town that are better at sequestering carbon. Uh, what else have we got? There's lots in there about waste. Um, we know that our waste is a big problem in Wellington, but we know that Councillor Foon has been really spearheading this issue. Um, and it all comes back to changing our attitude and perception towards our waste. So we need to move away from that out of sight, out of mind, main, uh, mind frame and um, you know, be thinking about about where our waste comes from, how we interact with it, and then where it goes after we dispose of it. Uh, and also, um, we there's some money set aside for an, an enviro tech accelerator. So um, that looks at how we can encourage the private sector and businesses to reduce their waste and reduce their emissions, um, because we know that we can't get to um, halved emissions by 2030 and net zero by 2050 if everyone isn't moving in the same boat together. You know, he waka iki no, as we say. Uh, and finally, um, there will be a suite of uh, traffic resolutions and minor street adjustments to make our streets more accessible for all people and uh, not just able-bodied people and uh, I guess middle-aged people so we want our streets to be conducive and safe for young people, old people, disabled people so that walking and cycling is a more attractive and preferable mode of transport as opposed to the private car. So that's what I'd say uh, kind of wrapped up uh, some of the provisions within the annual plan that will contribute to uh, cutting our emissions. Oh, not going on there. Thank you, thank you for that. 
Uh, do you have another question for us, Diane? I see them streaming in. I do. Um, I'm going to ask this one of you, Iona, and it's a fairly broad one, um, but there are quite a few questions about um, density, uh, um, how we're uh, managing growth and so forth. And the question is actually, uh, it's from Judith, uh, when she registered, and is what, uh, the question is, what is happening with the uh, Wellington City Council spatial plan? Oh, uh, kia ora everyone again, um, great question. Um, look, obviously we had to pause that due to COVID and I guess um, now we need to think about density maybe a little bit differently now that we have had the experience of a pandemic, you know, that we do need to be able to provide um, opportunities to uh, sometimes be a little bit apart. Um, but we know that lots of people want to come and live in Wellington, it's such a great city, um, and so we need to make sure that they're um, are amazing houses and green spaces and good infrastructure to support that. Um, and so look, we're just um, just making sure that um, we can engage safely with people and just looking at the process where we go from now. But we're keen to make progress on it this triennium and then get on to developing a new and exciting district plan. Mm -hmm. Lots of planning going on mm -hmm. and needed. Thank mm -hmm. you, Aya. Uh, next question, Diane. Nicola? Um, this is a question from Jacqueline and she's asking about the Convention Centre and what is the thinking about um, going ahead with that when there are so many other things that seem important at the moment um, and she mentions in particular the city needs housing for homeless. Would you like to talk to that? Sure, so um, hi, thank you for that question. So there are always competing priorities for city councils. And one of the things about the Convention Centre is uh, that it has largely been paid for by commercial ratepayers, not by residential ratepayers. Um, and part of the reason, part of the thinking behind it is that it will, first of all, really regenerate that part of Wellington um, between Te Papa and Courtney Place, which at the moment is a little bit suboptimal. Um, so that'll be great. The other thing is there are very few venues in Wellington where you can hold events. I mean, since yeah. I became a city councillor, I've got used to going to events and there are about four places you can go to. And uh, we really do need some big spaces like that. The thing with the convention center is it's underway. Uh, it's it's too late. I mean, we, we were never going to put um, housing for the homeless or affordable housing there. It's a very valuable commercial site. Um, but we have to try and look after all aspects of people who live in the city and that the convention center will help drive economic um, boost to that part of town. It will work in really well with Te Papa. They originally weren't so keen on it. Now they realize it will be a real strength to have the two next to each other. There'll be a great walkway to cut through so that that will be great for people walking around the city, which is, well, Iona and I are both um, mainly walking around Wellington. So we would appreciate it. Um, so it's the thing is that we don't, it's not one or the other. We're trying to do the best we can for everybody. And the convention center is a particularly exciting project, which I think, you know, has been controversial, is controversial, uh, just a bit like the Sydney Opera House was always controversial. So anyway, it's, um, it's underway. Lovely. Thank you, Nicola. Another question, Diane. Uh, yep. So this one's come in just now from Gerald, and I, I'm just going to, I'm not sure who would like to answer this, and actually if it's, it's more a kind of a development or a parking thing, but Gerald asks, in relation to developing a better planned sustainable residential density, it is clear that the one car park per dwelling requirement is preventing many good residential projects putting more importance on car storage and parking rather than people spaces uh, and I wondered if anyone on the panel has something uh, a, a, a response to that question. Who would like to respond to that? Andy. Yeah it's, it's working isn't it yeah but, um, thanks Gerald good good question it's one actually I thought probably we should have picked up in the parking the draft parking policy and so that people could have had a look at it there but the place that it will get picked up on, and, and you know, the parking policy is obviously open for submission, so you might want to make some comment about it. Uh, but the place that we will certainly be looking at this is in the district plan. Uh, so the, the aim is that we'll go through the, the spatial policy um, consultation, which was going to start um, uh, 6th of April. Uh, we'll go through that but later on in the year. The aim then will be to move to a draft district plan sometime, probably it was going to be the end of this year, now probably the beginning of next year because of COVID and then to a, um, a, an actual statutory district plan. This is going to be one of one of the important issues in there, one of many important issues. 
It's also going to be quite nuanced as well, because there are some places where actually requiring car parking ironically protects character. Uh, so it's going to be one we've got to think about very, very carefully uh, as to where we want parking. In some places, for example, if you're on a main route, uh, you might want the parking to be off street, whereas uh, on a another route, you might say, well, it's fine to have some parking on the street because it's not going to be a bus lane or a bike lane. So we've got to think very carefully through this. And I, I'd invite you when we get to that stage to give us feedback on those sort of things. So more coming and please contribute to that. Iona. Very quickly, um, great question, Gerald, and I completely support you and um, definitely be looking at that issue and would like to, um, particularly in Pukehinao, um, really get our suburbs very sustainable. You know, good access to public transport, walking, cycling, scootering is, is the best way to go from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Iona. And uh, COVID-19 has changed quite a lot, the amount of walking we're getting on our streets. So let's take another question. Um, question from Grace. Uh, Tamitha, I think this one's for you. And it is, what is the annual plan? What is in the annual plan for students? Okay, so, um, oh, this is a good question, given um, that I was the student president last year. I'm still understanding um, the, the the kind of nuance between the annual plan, the long-term plan, and the uh, spatial plan. In my opinion, just given my knowledge of student issues, we're looking at housing and we're looking at public transport. And I don't think um, either of those really fit into the annual plan, to be honest with you. So um, in terms of housing, that's, that's something that we will need to address through the long-term plan and through the spatial plan. Um, but prior to the lockdown, I was in contact frequently with both of the student associations, just making sure that students had adequate information and were able to submit on that. And I'll still be doing that work. It's just been um, deferred to be a, uh, to a bit later than we expected. So. That kind of covers that. And in terms of public transport, again, that's kind of more a regional council thing and providing those buses. But um, what I can say is that um, the relationship, this triennium so far has been really positive between ourselves and regional council. It seems like we're coming up with some really good solutions. Um, public transport is of course free until the 1st of June. Uh, so that means that you can jump on that if you need to. But I think that's kind of the, so sorry if you can hear that snoring. Um, <laughs> Um, but I think that's what I'd say. The other, the other thing I suppose is that students like to uh, go out to town and, and, and have fun and have lots of recreational things to do and I think it's important to acknowledge that our hospitality, arts and um, culture sectors, which also employ students quite heavily, has taken a massive hit due to COVID and I know many of our colleagues are working really hard to get that back and running and healthy again, including um, my colleague Nicola, Diane, Andy, I, all of us, we're all working our hardest to get that going again because we know that that's where a lot of student jobs are. So, yeah, so I think in terms of solving those systemic and long-term student issues, that's there's other venues to do that, but I think there's lots of things that students would support within the annual plan, nevertheless. Wonderful. Thank you, Tamitha. And I see there's uh, quite a lot of um, very specific technical um, parking questions coming through. Uh, we won't be able to take those now, but be assured that they will be answered uh, by officers and in the frequently asked questions. So uh, look out for those. We've got time for uh, just uh, two or three more questions. Diane, so make them some good ones. Okay, great. Well, I th well I'm liking this one. This one's, um, uh, look, I, I have to say, I'm sorry, I've lost who it came from, but they'll know who they are. Um, it's nothing happens in my area. Why is that? Nicola, do you want to have a go at that one? Well, um, sure. So it depends what the area is, um, because obviously there are some part, like if you live in Courtney Place, there'll be plenty happening, but it might not be what you want to do. Um, so it does very much depend. But there are, in most areas around Wellington, there are residents associations. Um, and so they often are a good point of contact for activities. Um, look in your local supermarket. There are notice boards there of things you can do. I mean, as a city council, a lot of our activities, our bigger activities, are focused um, in the centre of the city, which of course is our ward. So that lucky us. Um, but uh, I mean, I do I do think people um, should be able to find ways of of joining bridge clubs or you know walking clubs or all. It really depends on what you want to do. I mean, some people might want to take up learning a foreign language. Others may want to learn up learn how to take up um, yoga for example so there are plenty of places where there are um, you know inf there is information about that and the council produces a booklet once is it once a quarter uh, which has 
all the things that are going to be on in the city, which is a very helpful um, compendium of all that is happening. So I, I think there's plenty of information there. It's just a matter of, of trying to find it. And if you can't, um, send me an email at council. I'll find, I'll find things for you to do. I've always found things for my children to do. Yeah, good. And Tamitha, you um, wanted to respond? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that and just say, um, at the moment, uh, Zealandia is free to the public. Um, the zoo, I believe, is free also to the public. So there's lots of lots of our kind of main attractions are all trying to bring people back in. So I think one of the big ways we can support them as locals is go out there and, and explore. I know in Zealandia, there's lots of different tracks that you can go down to, to explore. You can find different birds every time, different tracks. And same with the zoo, you might find different animals every time. So I know there's heaps of extra things to do at the moment. Fantastic. Look out for those. Uh, Diane, a couple more. Okay. Um, this is a new one from uh, Gabriella. It's just come in live. Um, and it's to do with shovel ready projects. So um, are, are there any specific projects that uh, we have put forward to government as one of the ones that can get up and running quite quickly to help with the recovery? And I'm just whoever would like to talk to that. Yeah, I, I, I should do that one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we've, we've participated with the regional councils or the councils of the region, so all nine councils and putting to, uh, putting to government a, uh, a whole series of regional um, scale uh, shovel ready projects. And then we also put our own in and also Let's Get Wellington, the Let's Get Wellington moving package with, through NZTA, there's also um, a set of um, proposals there. The ones that we put in in our, in our own right, there were several uh, in the water space. Uh, so Amorara Reservoir was one, there was some um, uh, stormwater pro projects and pump station projects. Uh, social housing was in there as well, um, particularly Harrison Street, but also across the portfolio as a whole. Uh, we also put in the convention centre was in there because we were always hoping for some government support for that. Uh, and we also put in the municipal office building. So that's the, the old council building uh, next to the town hall. Uh, we're hoping to put this, the School of Music into that, but it's a pretty challenging project. So um, we put that one in there as well. Uh, we put a couple of others in too. Sorry about that break in uh, transmission, but let's take a final uh, question. I'm going to throw this open to the panel. Um, and this is a question from Tim. He says, I'd like to hear more about how can council plans to build back better from COVID-19 in terms of equitable, inclusive, climate and environmental friendly, environmentally friendly city and how this could flow on from the annual plan to the long-term plan. Quite a, a mouthful there. Uh, but let's hear from a couple of you, um, Iona and Andy, and uh, we'll wrap with that. Iona, would you like to start? Hi, Tim. Hey, great question. Um, so, um, Tamitha and I moved that, um, um, we worked with a lot of our colleagues on that. Um, absolutely, like this um, COVID-19 has been a disaster, but um, it does also provide us an opportunity to build back better, which is why we put together a package um, as Tamith has already indicated, around um, energy efficiency, around green infrastructure, um, around um, definitely around some walking. So, and what we're hoping to do is to use this as a, a small foundation to build um, into something much bigger for the long term plan. Um, and I'm sure many of us will have some big ambitions, but um, I'm certainly keen to see a lot more earthquake strengthening going on, more climate friendly infrastructure being built, lots of cycleways and so on. So it's really exciting. Thank you. Tim, good question. I actually voted against that package of, um, of recommendations because it is going to increase our rates. And my big concern is to make sure that Wellington is affordable. And I am very concerned about the rates, the cost of the rates for people, especially when many are losing their jobs or having compulsory pay cuts. I think we have to focus on making sure we can pay our bills and make sure that Wellington is affordable for everybody rather than having lots of nice to have projects. So I have a di totally different um, perspective on that one. Thank you. And Thank you for coming. Yes, sir, if, I, if I can just tell you also, Tim, what the, the kind of things which we were doing uh, anyway um, and intending to do, and in fact, we're trying to accelerate. So in the Let's Get Wellington moving space, we're trying to, uh, and again, it's one of the shovel ready uh, areas, uh, accelerate walking, cycling and public transport initiatives. Uh, obviously, the urban planning work that we do, the, the more compact our city is, and obviously we've got to do a bit of thinking around what what COVID and, and a bit of separation uh, might require us to do, but the more compact we are, the more able we are to walk, walk, cycle, use public transport, and therefore the lower our emission level is. 
And then also in the, um, the environmental restoration space, we've been doing an incredible, we've had an incredible restoration journey over the last, uh, well, my entire time on council. Uh, it's something I'm amazed, uh, really proud of. We've got a real opportunity now to, to add to that and the government's jobs for nature um, uh, budget allocation, we've got the opportunity, particularly if people in our city lose uh, jobs, to be able to give some meaningful employment in doing uh, environmental restoration work. So I've put our hand up uh, as a council and said, we want to be part of that. Uh, and then of course, um, we've already had the mention of a circular economy, so we need to do more in trying to make sure that we don't just put waste in the ground. Uh, and we're also, this year, we'll be getting a report back uh, in September uh, on sludge uh, treatment. So we're trying to put less, again, less into the landfill. And the final thing to mention is that uh, we have uh, the action plan for Te Atakura, um, the uh, first to zero, our carbon, uh, carbon neutral policy. Uh, and that will include a lot of those things, but it will include a lot of other things as well. So we, we are advancing on this on many fronts and we are, you know, we're aiming to be a more sustainable city. Um, across all of those areas. Andy, would you like to wrap us by uh, telling people why they should bother putting in a submission to the annual plan? Because it makes a difference. We don't know everything. Um, we want your views. We want to know what your priorities are. And sometimes you're going to know things that we we don't know. And and that's what that's what the value is there. And also, if we put out a proposal, you people come at this. There's, there's no such thing as the community view. There are a whole range of different views within our community and we need to hear those and that needs to be able to influence the decisions that we make. So, you know, we, we really want to hear from you, not, not just on the annual plan, but on the parking policy and indeed on anything else we do. As I said, you know, we're going to be putting the uh, the library um, information out uh, to you uh, as of tomorrow and um, you'll be able to look at that and be able to give us your views on that as well. So your, your views count and so I'd encourage you to participate. It's your city. So, um, Olivia, if you could bring up a slide that just uh, outlines for people how they can uh, participate in this process. Uh, you can have your say via the Let's Talk Wellington uh, website. Uh, there's also social media options. Uh, you can email submissions to these uh, two email addresses and there's a dedicated uh, consultation helpline to help you with this process. So please, uh, you, you've, you've heard tonight, all of your councillors and uh, your mayor uh, invite you to put in submissions. Um, and we'd like to run a final poll, if you could bring that up, Olivia, to see uh, how many of you are interested in putting in submissions, if indeed at all, if you could run that poll. So can you tell us how you plan to provide feedback on the annual plan or the parking policy? So. Uh, and it's, uh, you, can, you can tick multiple boxes, so you can tick the annual plan and the parking policy. It'd be fantastic to hear from you. Let us know you, if you're not sure yet, uh, if you're still deciding, uh, and perhaps you won't be providing feedback at all. So are those starting to come in? Yes, Olivia? we've had a great portion of our attendees tonight vote on that poll, so I'm going to close that now and share the results with you all. Oh, fantastic. So we're getting uh, a lot of people wanting. That's great. So well over you uh, wanting to provide uh, submissions and some of you still thinking about it. Thank you very much for that. So um, thank you for um, bearing with us. Uh, tonight, there's been some transmission difficulties from uh, several quarters. Uh, this recording will be up on uh, closed captioned on Wednesday. Your questions, which we have not been able to get to, will be answered uh, along with the others from the other webinars. And there, there are certainly some themes there uh, so that you can get answers to your questions. Um, so the last thing I would like to say is thank you very much to the panel for coming out tonight uh, and thank you also to the team that stands behind you, uh, Olivia, Amy, Diane and Claire who have been making all of this happen but most importantly uh, to you, uh, the, um, our participants, our, our residents um, who have joined us to be a part of this process. Andy, would you like to close us with a karakia? A pleasure. Unihia, 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 kiti uru tapunui. Kia watia, kia mama, te naka, titi nana, te wairua, i te ara takatu. Koea ra e rongo, whakarea ake ki ronga. Kia watia, kia watia, 
Ai ra kua watia. Kia ora. Amen. Kia ora, everyone. Thank you all for coming along.